The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Welcome to the Empower Hour with Greater Nashville Mental Health. The Empower Hour will provide information and support about mental health, substance use, and behavioral health. Our goal is to share inspiring stories about transforming lives, to strike down stigma, and to encourage our community to reach out and get help when needed. Mental health is part of all of our lives. It's time we talk about it. I'm Dr. Cynthia Whitaker, President and CEO of Greater Nashville Mental Health, and it's time to get empowered. Welcome to the Empower Hour with Greater Nashville Mental Health. This is our first episode and we're really excited to share with you why we chose to have a show called the Empower Hour. Our mission at Greater Nashville Mental Health is empowering people to live full and satisfying lives through effective treatment and support. What that means to us is that we have a desire for all people to live empowered lives to their fullest potential. That means all people, our clients, our staff, and everyone in the community. So we wanted to bring this show to you to give some tidbits about not only the things that we do and the services that we provide, but also to maybe help you find a gem to help you live the most empowered life that you can so you too can live to your potential. I'm so excited today to get to start off our show with our first guest, who's Susan Mead, who's worked for Greater Nashua for almost 35 years. Susan, I'm so happy that you could join today. Thank you. It's an honor to have been asked. So I'd love to just start with who I am and who you are, because I didn't tell our audience who I am. So I am Dr. Cynthia Whitaker, the president and CEO of Greater Nashua, and I've worked for the agency with you uh, for almost 15 years, and you've with it, been with us for almost 35. So why don't you start with who, who you are and what your connection is to us? Again, thank you for having me. You forgot to for add that you're a deaf service <laughs> assigner and really uh, it's, we'll get it's okay but it's i'm susan mead I, I, i'm the community educator and outreach director at greater nash mental health i'm also the state hospital liaison i started as a case manager when we had 55 employees one building and we're up to over 200 employees with four buildings. So I've literally, literally grown up with community council. Now I need, oh, there we go, community council, Greater National Mental Health. Um, through being a case manager to, uh, I helped with MST, which is multi-service teams, which is equivalent to our acute care teams um, for ACT. Um, and then I was a clinician, I ran emergency services, and then PATH came along, Projects to Assist Transition from Homelessness. So my role is to help engage those who have a mental health issue or a substance use issue and a mental illness and are homeless or at risk of being homeless. So that's been my mission for the last 30 years. Um, so let's back up for a second. So sure. you use the terminology community council, uh, uh, right? You caught me. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's on so film. <laughs> it's on film. We caught we caught you. We caught you with it. Um, so that's because we started our right. history, right, as Thank an organization you. about a hundred years ago, and started as community welfare council. Then we came the community mental health center, changed to community council of Nashua, and then you know kind of really embraced the identity of mental health center and changed to Greater Nashua Mental Health Center at Community Council for a while, and now are simply known as Greater Nashua Mental Health. Um, and so interesting that you know you have a lot of that history um, within the different pockets that that you've worked in at, within for us. So I'm sure in there there's some examples of people you've helped or things you've seen in the community really just shift because of the services that have been provided. 
a long time, for a long time, we, I think we really worked in silos and I don't think we had the partnerships that we do today mm. in the community. One being a mental health center, I think there's a stigma that goes with that, but we've been out in the community. I think the difference about a mental health center is we're in the communities. Yeah. We're reaching out, we're going to where they're comfortable, helping them navigate the city and the stores or bank, whatever it is that interrupts somebody's ability to do so. Um, I was able to meet somebody who was homeless living from California and she had a mood disorder and never talked to people. And one day in a winter, she came in on her bike and got hit by a car oh. and had to be hospitalized. And she couldn't return to the woods because her back um, injury so that she needed to get involved with services and she was a fiery soul and I think I was called every name in the book that day <laughs> and she just had a really hard time dealing with people and as I was leaving she said Susan I know you're trying to help me mm. so in my belief I know people have a sense that something's not right they may not be able to verbalize it they may not be able to recognize exactly what that is. Uh, and it took just some building of that trust to get her to a better place. Mm -hmm. And um, we had some challenges at first and she was hospitalized because she was still uh, really having difficulty managing her temper and her tone. And, and was again, she when she got better, she said, I didn't realize how hard it was to talk to people. Mm -hmm. Her issue was dealing with people. And that's why she lived in the woods. Once mm -hmm. she was in treatment, she really embraced meeting people in a new way. And five years down the road, she wrote a thank you note after really having her on a conditional discharge from the state hospital, she had to be court ordered to stay in treatment. And then after that period of time, she got her own apartment, she mm. got her own car, she got a part-time job. She, she really succeeded. So I have hundreds of stories of folks where I've seen them at their worst and engaging them, I'm able to bring them into the experts in our, in our building. I, I, I see that I have the luckiest role in the sense that it's, I find it really uh, challenging to try to get to know what it is you, you do, what it is pulling that out and then working with you to get to a better place. Now, I don't know if I need to fix my mic. Here we go, let's do this, sorry about that. That's okay. So what I heard you say was that you've worked with many clients when they're at their worst. And sometimes even when they're at their worst, they might call you names for trying to help them or even try to push you away and not want your help. But then there's this moment or this insight where they really maybe do realize, right. even as they're pushing you away, right? they need our help. Correct. And I think I, I met somebody who had been isolating in their extended family's house and he would sleep by day and get up at nighttime. The mother, the grandmother would create some food for them and she, he would not want to see anybody. So he'd literally sleep all day, come down at 11 at night and go to bed at 7.30 in the morning. And he had a depressive disorder, an anxiety disorder that was untreated. He hadn't been out of his house in 20 years. In 10 years, um, they had a fire in the kitchen. He had to go out into the driveway, but he was isolative up until that point. And I said, tell him I'm coming over to visit him at 7.30 in the morning. And mm. sure enough, he was waiting for me in the living room. And he looked different. He hadn't seen the sun. He hadn't seen... Uh, daylight. Um, and uh, my very first question was, on a scale of one to 10, how anxious are you right now? And 10 being high and very quietly, he said 12. Hmm. He hadn't talked to anybody in 20 years. And so I stayed 15 minutes, came back the next week, did it for about a month. 
And in three months, I was able to get him into my car and just be able to drive around the block, building up. It took me about six months before he trusted going into the agency. And he ended up being diagnosed with a depression and anxiety disorder. And in another three months, he was then staying up by day, again, got a part-time job, got a license back, got his life back, got, was interacting with his family again. So that's, that's the, the joy I get from doing what I do, because I know they know they're not doing well on some levels and may not have known what choices they had mm. to get better or, or how to get there, so to speak. Mm. But really hard to trust somebody to oh, come in yeah. and find the help. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes people are able to just walk into our agency and ask for an appointment. But other times their symptoms make it so hard that they don't even know how to ask for help or they are so fearful of, of that help, so right. you, you really help with those, with those people. Personally, I, I, in growing up, I really was blessed. I had a, f a family that really cared, and I needed help at one point, and they helped me get there, and with my friends. I had a good circle of looking out for me, if you will, and that helped also, and what I notice some people don't have that kind of support mm. in place. And um, in my generation, my, the parents wouldn't talk about mental health issues. It wasn't something that folks felt comfortable about. So I had a slew of 40-year-old people that weren't treated because they didn't know how to address it. Mm. So I, I, I mean, this gentleman was in his 40s and had gone 20 years feeling isolative and I just it's so sad but now he's back living his life and doing well um, I've I've I remember when I met somebody on the street who purposely w had urinated to get arrested so he could be in jail mm. in the winter time and it was at that point I remember going back to then the executive director saying, we don't even know how to talk to the jails. We don't have a relationship with the police. We don't, I lost the guy, I didn't know where to turn to. And we formed, a, back then it was called the Legal Liaison Committee back in 98. And I invited all the police chiefs, the judges, the prosecutors, just to see if we could start a dialogue. And I tell you, the first year was intense. Mm. I had a, a family member from National Alliance for Mental Illness, NAMI, and he was a father slash Marine. And so when his son had a mental health issue, he, not, he, he wanted nothing more for his son to be able to follow his footsteps, but he recognized this was a mental health issue. And when he met superintendent of the jails, there was fireworks. I mean, I think everyone brought passion, mm. recognizing we could do a better job. But the first year, there were debriefings after that meeting because we didn't know how to talk to each other. We mm. didn't have acronyms. And I know we have a slew of acronyms. Sure every, do. every world does, right? So it became a cross-education of of what your boundaries are, what what rules do you have to follow? Um, sometimes when folks went to jail, our attitude was, okay, they'll take care of them, didn't talk to them. We've done a 180 with yeah. that. We are on yeah. top of that. We have point people that if they want to stay on their medications, there's that relationship that it just built over time. And part of my grant allowed me to do education, and I thought that was what was really important that folks really didn't have an idea of how to recognize if somebody had mm -hmm. symptoms mm -hmm. or signs of mental illness. So that's started crafting a presentation on mental health awareness. What's yeah. it look like if somebody has depression, if somebody has schizophrenia, what's a delusion? It's a false belief system. You know, don't challenge the delusions. You work mm -hmm. with them. It's, it's, it's all those tips on you know, the to-dos and not to-dos when you're trying to engage someone in services that have, have a mental illness. But that's been tremendous. It's only gotten better, I, I believe. Yeah. Um, 
the relationships are huge now. When Judge Leary took it over, it mushroomed. Um, as our, our current district court judge, you're involved, which empowers our whole agency to work with the courts in a better way. We've identified a court liaison. It's just Mark Durso is our current liaison who's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. everyone brings something new to that role. Um, of course, I need to mention Jill O'Neill because <laughs> she really put some structure and efficacy to it and um, just so proud yeah. of my role in it was to get people to talk and and it really that was it and and it sort of grew from there so I, it's it's the proudest thing I'm, I feel part of um, mm. because it takes working together and we're we're doing that in a way we've never done so yeah. that to me is is huge success I think we've diverted Oh, but in my time when I was involved, over 300 people back then, so much so that the uh, Hillsborough County Department of Corrections then helped fund that position right. because we were redirecting folks into treatment yeah. versus going to jail. So it was significant, had a significant impact in the community. So There's so much to what you, yeah. you just said there, so much. So first, Definitely, we'll have Mark and or Jill oh, come and talk about thank mental you. health court thank and you. what it looks like today thank you. On, on another episode because absolutely Each. a fabulous program. Yeah. Um, but I, I think there's two other things in kind of what you were saying. One was just that role in bringing people together in the community. So what, you know, what it took to create this program that, you know, that's now flourishing and putting, um, putting treatment before incarceration for folks that really need it. But what it took to make that happen w was a collaborator, a bringing people together for that conversation. So that's, that's kind of one thing. And then the second thing you said was really the importance of the education. And, you know, and where my mind went to was stigma, right? And how your role of helping to educate police officers and in that initial meeting, kind of getting the therapists to be able to talk to the police and the, the judge and um, is really about education. And if people knew better, they would do better, right? And, and so your role in helping to just educate people I, so I, important. It is. It, and in my mind, awareness cures. If mm. you're not even aware... Mm. of what it is you're doing that is causing you to perhaps make poor decisions or not have the, the lack of insight into what prevents you to move forward. It, it really, I think the family and friends and your community base can go so far. And I think really those who have a really more underlining mental health issue, a severe and persistent mental health issue, is when they really need professionals to help them mm -hmm. through that. Um, and our staff is amazing at that. Um, it, tr it truly, when you see people, when they first come in and even a year later, dropping those seeds and and mm. just having faith in them and and sort of pulling that out is really the art and the the I don't know again the joy I get from that and mm. when you see people get the aha, you know you can you've moved forward you've empowered them to move forward. I really think part of the trick is really finding out what it is they want, mm. right? Mm -hmm. I, I think mm -hmm. a lot of times we have. What we need to do as far as getting somebody to apply for Medicaid or so they can get benefits, but they want to be able to go whatever it is. And you really, it's a parallel walk of, of meeting your need and, and showing how they can get more help by following some of the suggestions we have. So it's, it's, um, I noticed when I started this job, I felt like I was working harder and, and pushing harder than I should be. Mm. I've learned to walk with it. It's, it's sort of, when you're ready, I'm ready. It's, it's my new mantra. It's, it's sort of trying, I, I'm sort of get her done, let's fix this, and, and that's not how this works, right? Say more about that, because I think that's yeah. a really important point. I think for, for both family members, individuals themselves, us as clinicians, Right, like just 
what is it or what have you learned about the most effective way to walk alongside somebody? Like, what have you learned about that? Well, a lot, depending on the person, right? I think we have all have an eclectic bag of, of tools we use mm -hmm. to try and engage mm -hmm. somebody, but it's, it's really that relationship mm -hmm. and, and building that trust. I, I find, depending on someone's, if someone has a trauma history, it takes a while for them to realize that you're genuine in wanting to help them be in a better space. And I think once they feel that, and once they sense that I'm not any, out to do anything to you, it's doing it with you, mm -hmm. with your blessing, with your uh, participation, that's when the person gets empowered, right? It's, exactly. it's, it's, it's engaging that person's spirit. It's, it's, it's pulling that with you and, and um, it wor it's been working. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but it depends who I'm talking to it, um, to answer that question. I remember when I was working harder mm -hmm. than the client, I'd have to sit back and go, ooh, I'm working harder here. Maybe they're not ready for this, you know, sort of slow it down, Susan. I, I have to pull in my own reins and I mm -hmm. sometimes have to stop myself from talking. Again, it's, it's, I'm wanting to see the results and trying to get somebody to a better space. And maybe they're not ready to do that yet. Mm -hmm. So I, I heard you say relationship, individualized, right? So it's really right. about listening to the person and what's important for them. Correct. Right? Um, yes. What, what you made me think of is you made me think of a, a, a talk that I gave where I talked about it's not about the check boxes. Right, that sometimes we want life, treatment, whatever we're doing to be quick, easy, clean. You know, oh, I do this and then I do this and then I do this, check, check, check. But life is messy and people are messy and it's, it's more about connection and working together and, and trusting the process and going wherever we need to go. Maybe if it's, you know, the first checkbox and then the third and then the fifth and then back up to the second. And, that it doesn't always go the way we think it's going to go, and Correct. we have to be okay with that. And sitting with their being uncomfortable is important. Yeah. And and it it just to work through that with them is an important part of that process. I think we're very all interdependent. I think yeah, that I you that. affect me, I affect you, and there's a ripple effect in how we all impact each other. I, I truly believe we we all have our uh, impact. Um, and so it's, I think you have to be very mindful to recognize folks who have mental health issues are intelligent. I think mm -hmm. there's so many myths. Yeah, you know, one in five people, they say, will have a major mental illness in their adult life. I'll tell you it's one in one. Given mm -hmm. enough stress, <laughs> We can all crack. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I, yeah. I say that. Um, I, I say that wholeheartedly. I yeah. really believe yeah. that we're here not to see through one another. We're here to see one another through. It, yeah. it, it, it's a. Uh, I take my time leading. I take my time following. I, it, it, you know, I working with a new person now, and I feel like I'm mentoring him. But his style, and now he's mentoring me. It's sort of learning from each other. Um, depending on our backgrounds and what we have to offer. I mean, I'd say that's true of working with yeah. clients. I mean, yes. I've certainly worked with yes. clients who, you know, I'm technically the expert in the room, right? I'm the expert in the room. But yet there's so much to learn back and forth from one another because they're the expert on their life, exactly. not me. I, I'm So it is that you use the term walking alongside, walking with, um, right. And I think that's, that's what people need, right? People need safety. They need to know they're, they belong or they're they Sense matter. of connectedness yeah, is sense exactly of connectedness. Right. Yeah. very important. You triggered a, a thought. My father was a, in the veteran uh, services in World War II, and he would say to me, never discount where you'll find your hero. Oh, never discount where you'll find your hero. And... I look at clients and I, I, my gosh, 
what they've lived through and their resilience and how they can come back up in their own right. Mm -hmm. They're heroes in my mind because I, I look what my upbringing was like and, and thought everybody had a nice upbringing. But guess what? You know, I, I even had my struggles growing up. But I had a family. I mm -hmm. had support systems. I, and I look at folks who don't have that or feel they don't have that or they've been isolated or there have been some poor choices so the family members are, are, are not sure how to interact with that person. Um, I would like to put out there that that is what I do. I'm mm. the back door clinician. I rather coin it as somebody who has a lot of resources being in the community over 30 years. Um, and I'm an engager. I, I really feel as if once I, I hear somebody's story, I have ability to connect them to maybe what, maybe they hadn't thought about vocational rehabilitation paying for their schooling if they have a certain aptitude and they have a disability. There's so many opportunities that I don't think people are even aware of. Mm. Um, and that's the benefit of being there so long. I, 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 and I, I'm not even up to date with all of the services. There, there's so many services from our agency now that, that you're going to have a long show of, of, of doing just what many, we offer. Many, many episodes <laughs> on all the things that are happening at Greater Nashua. I, yeah, I mean, I look forward to that for sure. But I, I think this is a fantastic conversation for us to start with because I think it sets the foundation for what we believe. And, and that's why having you come and us talking about you know, what we believe, what you've seen over your 35 years of working with us is that every individual has a superpower within them. It's just that not everybody had the environment or the people around them to help them identify it. Well put, exactly right, Cynthia, I, I, I agree. I agree. And I've been there now that where I've helped a family member and I'm generations of folks who might experience similar mental illnesses, they now will refer them to me because they remember how I helped engage them initially. Mm. That I think the true test that I'm I'm doing all right is that other clients and homeless folks are now referring me to other people, mm -hmm. telling me where I can find somebody. And, and again, I'm not there, I'm not gonna do anything to anybody. My efforts is really to try, how can, do you wanna move forward? Do we wanna change this course a little so that you're off the streets? Are you aware that there's supports, that there's a warming center now? Are you, I think a lot of folks aren't even aware of where they can turn, um, However, I will say with this COVID pandemic, the silver lining is people are now talking about mental health. Yeah, it, right. I have never heard on national news now people are talking about people coming out and sharing their stories, right? right? Don't we all have our story of, yeah, of, yeah. of our own struggles? I truly believe we all have our dragons, right? And mm -hmm. it depends how we wanna look at that or hide it, or bury it, or look at it. Um, and in different days, we are stronger than others to do so. Right, right. Um, it, yours truly, I mean, I, I, I'm the same way, right? Yours we, truly. We, <laughs> some days we were on top of it, and other days, not so much. Yeah, but, yeah. I, but you, you just reminded me of like, that I think sometimes we think in black and white, right? So we think, oh, if I've got a dragon, I don't have a superpower. Right, or if I have a flaw, I don't have a strength, but both coexist. Exactly. Right, and, and that, I mean, we get to see that in our clients while they're struggling, but they also can shine at the same time, exactly. right? I mean, it, it, it's true for all of us. Correct, and right? it's that art of pulling the that out. The art of pulling it out. It's exactly what it is all about. And that yeah. that's that seed that you're talking about. I, I love that analogy you use, like a seed. So what are some of the seeds you think you drop? Yeah. 
Plenty. <laughs> I have plenty. So much so that I have what I call my manic gardens. I have them everywhere. I need to see change. Mm. Um, and I need to, I, I think you drop seeds and you have to wait. You have to walk away uh, and let it, let them think about that. Or have you thought about this? Um, I often, when I am seeing somebody that making the same pattern and mistakes, I'll ask them if they know how to, how a sailboat works. And if they're aware of that rudder that steers where the boat's going, and by changing that one degree, by changing one little behavior, their destiny changes. Mm -hmm. And versus asking somebody to quit smoking, lose your weight, join a group. I mean, they'll capsize, right? If, if you ask somebody to change that much. Right. When you I move that rudder too fast. Move that rudder, you're, you're capsizing. Right. I, my, and my thought is, give me one to 3% change and let's see, where, let's see how your, your path changes. And, it, and, and they buy that because mm -hmm. they can ship off a little bit they start seeing the mm -hmm. changes, um, not immediate. Uh, as someone said, it's more of a marathon. The longer somebody has gone untreated with mm -hmm. a mental health Great. issue, it, some takes, it takes a little longer to bring them back and, and, mm -hmm. and get them where they're feeling comfortable. So you have to hold a lot of hope for people when Thank they you. don't have hope, It's right? the word, it's the, it's, it is, it's hope. Yeah. It's kindness, it's courage, it's, it's, patience. All, it, it's, it's all those things. Um, it is patience. Yeah. It is patience. Um, trying to think of other stories for you, there's so many. Do you have a moment that you're most proud of or you feel like your superpower was allowed to shine through in a moment? When I get that letter, you know, after someone's called me <laughs> again, every name mm. in the book, and they they they've come around to say you changed my life. This one woman I was sharing the story about in the woods uh, st was thriving for mm. years in the community, and she decided to go to Colorado and stop treatment. And two years after she left, she called me from a psychiatric ward in New Hampshire, she goes, Susan, this is where I am. I'm like, well, you know what you need to do. I mean, you've been down this path. You know, I know what I need to do. Mm. And it was sort of that reassurance that, but I thought I already dealt with this. Well, it's something that some things are persistent, some mm -hmm. things you need to keep an eye on. Um, and some people, you know, if, if they're having extreme mood swings, I'm always concerned about how you're sleeping tonight? How did you sleep last night? It's, it's sort of checking in with those mm. um, warning signs, if you will. If someone says, I've been up for three days, ah, my, my antenna's going off, mm -hmm. going, gosh, how are your decision making after you haven't slept for a week? Mm. You know, that's when folks make poor choices. Um, and it's really, it's getting back to those basics of health, right? Of yeah. taking care yeah. of yourself. And I think we needed to do it for ourselves. I take that very seriously. When I leave work, I'm changing my clothes, washing my hands, getting in the dirt, literally grounding myself, playing with the, the gardening. Um, mm. You need to feed yourself so that you can do what we do. I really believe that. If, if, and acknowledge where you lack. Um, I'm a terrible person with com computers. I, I stutter when I say it. But and I miss IT across the hallway because I, I frequently have issues. So recognizing what you do well is important, but also mm -hmm. recognizing where I need the team. My, mm -hmm. my team is Greater National Mental Health. <laughs> I, I, they're my backup. And I, when I'm referring people in, I know they're getting good help. I, oh. I, I'm confident in that. So I think the other thing that's important to me is I learn every day. Hmm. either through a client sharing something that I wasn't aware of or Dr. P sharing something I didn't know. It just just people are have so many nuggets. You you have so many nuggets. So it's just it's um, that's an important part of my growth. And hmm. so I thank you for that. I, I I don't I had jobs for a year at a time 
and I would be bored and I left. I was a tennis pro or I, it was this. But when I came here, I always have a new story. It's, it's, mm. it's the first time I met an older woman and she has a, a, she had a, a farm, she has a farm and she's down to one cow and she asked me if I could find her a support, uh, a, a place where they would take a support cow. And she was joking with me, but you gotta love that. She, she, uh, she's managing this house on her own um, at 80, I bless her heart. Uh, but that was her way of saying, can you find a place that will take a support cow? That way, I keep thinking I've heard it all, and then I come back to work the next day. And that's the brilliance of it, right? Um, right, so every, every day is a new experience because we're, we're working with people, and everybody's an individual and, and different. We are. Right? And everybody's worth, everybody's worth that relationship and that trust and... Um, coming in and getting the support they need from the agency or if they're not ready for that for us to send in somebody like you to go <laughs> develop that relationship and that trust over time and it is about them. that isn't it it's it's yeah. in everything I think the relationship development is key it's not only within our organization our partners in the community our clients mm -hmm. it's it's that development of trust and and I believe that once they really sense that you're investing in them and that you do care, that that's when they really start, oh, I am capable. Mm -hmm. I am lovable. I am huggable. It's all those things that they don't think they are, mm -hmm. right? And it's, um, we're here for hope. I, I yeah. definitely think Speranza, that's what Dr. Kufnick used to say. It, it, it's about dropping seeds of hope, and that's what we do. Um, and it works, and, and, it, and, works. and it, it does. I think, I think people now are, are able to look at mental health better mm -hmm. because of this pandemic. I think people have been in that dark place uh, by themselves in their, in their homes, and, um, and hopefully, with the development, people have ingeniously have the telehealth, and and we've grown to meet that need is remarkable hmm. to you all. It's nothing I would know how to do, <laughs> but <laughs> kudos to to all of you who made that possible. I, I was helping somebody in Litchfield who had no transportation, depressed, staying in, and now this telehealth before wasn't available, and now she's getting the help. I mean, the timing for her no, was good. perfect because a lot of folks can't get in even because of transportation issues, mm. finding a sitter, what, whatever the issue is. Right. Um, I think it's wonderful, and I, I'm, I'm hopeful we can continue some of that. I think face-to-face -face also has its value and merit, but for those who need that, um, other mechanism, I, I, I think it's brilliant. I think it's helpful. So. Yeah, I mean, it reminds me of like what you said, of you meet with somebody and then you get them to a different service. Maybe, you know, telehealth is a way to get somebody to engage. And then, you know, if face-to-face -face is better, then they can shift to that once they're comfortable. It's a way to build, build that trust. Exactly. There's, there's one thing you and I have spoke about before that came up in my mind um, when you were just talking about safety and trust and pulling it out of people in connection, you know, and that's that, you know, the people you're talking about and who you've worked with are folks that need that because of a severe mental illness that gets in their way. And, and, and so that, you know, us coming in as the professionals, but really that's a way for us to interact with everybody, to improve everybody's mental health, right? Like that there's only a tip of the triangle that needs the expert help or the, in the, the real acute help. And then if more of us were talking mm. in that, those ways to one another, we'd have more of a healthy community because we would have those feelings of safety and you know, be able to be vulnerable. And, and one of the benefits of what I do is I get to know who are running the shelters or who's mm. running 
uh, Mary's house or and it's that connection to the staff and making that connection mm -hmm. with the staff on the sense that I do care about you as well. I mean, some folks are dealing with incredible difficulties and they have their own stress to manage with their jobs. And hearing that in itself is, is lending a therapeutic gear, if you will. Uh, it, that is, I find that very important. Mm -hmm. and, and I always encourage folks who are going into the community, make sure you say hi to the landlord if there's a relationship there. Or say hello to the program manager so that they have a sense of connection too. If, if there's sometimes our eyes and ears, right. right? So I'll get a phone call, oh, so-and-so is, you know, might be throwing something out the window and I'm like, that's a sign that, you know, she's not sleeping, let's get over there, let's see what's going on. So it's, it's helpful uh, to let them know we're going to be responding as well. I think that's what the nice part about mental health centers is our ability to get into the communities. Sorry about the mic. It's okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Mike difficulties. But. We 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 want to be we want to walk that walk, right? I was, I was like it's not a talk, it's a walk, right? And and uh, I and I love I love that you embody that for us, right? That you are just you're in the community all the time. You're you're known. I mean, who in Nashville doesn't know Susan Mead? You know, well, you'd be surprised. People say that, but it makes me nervous when you say that. But um, I think people know I care. Yeah. I think people know I'm going to do something about it. Um, and if you can't, you'll find somebody who will. Thank or you for saying that. Or you'll call me up Exa and say, Cynthia, you know. how do we solve this problem? Just like you did with the legal about that client, you know, many, many years ago to, you know, bloom, plant the seed for what's exactly. now, you know, a full-blown mental health court program that grew from Nashua to then Manchester, so all of Hillsborough County, now, you know, potential legislation to have across the state. I mean, how awesome is that? It's, I just smile thinking about it. Just, yeah. I, I, I do. My dad was an inventor, and he well, was a chemical engineer, and he always had a can-do spirit. And mm. I think I, and my mother was the one who read people well. So I, I feel like I have a the combination of of those two, in that I think I read people well, mm. and I'm I have the courage to step into the other arenas if I see something that isn't fitting right. Right. Um, Right, that Getting, can do spirit. That can do spirit comes yeah. through, and and I have a feeling that optimism, that hope, also is rippling into folks I touch in the the, the sense that you know when I'm trying to engage you, you you know when I'm trying to pull pull your stuff out, and mm -hmm. and. I really do see good in people, and I and I and I think sometimes they just like you said, the voices in our head. If I'm not thin enough. I'm not tall. I'm, you know all these things. We we all have that based mm -hmm. on, you know, what is put out in the world in the media and whatnot. And I think we just we need to bring it back to being real with each other and and that compassion, that homemade <laughs> that that. That I was going to say homemade gifts. It's sort of that the realness of things mm -hmm. um, is we need to get back to that, I think. Yeah. And maybe there's maybe that goes back to what you were saying about the positive that can come out of the pandemic is I do think we're seeing a little bit more of that vulnerability, honesty, you know, um, and how do, how do we keep that going? Because I think mental illness or mental unwellness lives in secrecy. It breeds, it downward spirals, if you will. But when we talk about it, when we have conversations, when we feel safe, 
we can kind of pull out of that and, exactly. and find more mental wellness. Correct. Um, and, and, but that happens for every single one of us, which again, you know, kind of brings us back to that empower hour, right? About empowering people. And yes, our mission is focused on our clients and empowering them through our treatment and support. But as a community mental health center, you know, we really care about everybody's mental wellness. Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, right. Right. I yeah. wasn't sure if I should share, but I, I, I know a department that, that had a suicide and mm. the fact that they came out publicly about it versus sweeping it under the, the rug and, and saying unexpected death, it made it more talkable. The depression that folks do deal with suicidal ideation, know there's hope out there. Know there's somebody that can help you. And I think that is part of our message, right? That yes. if you want help, it's there. Yeah. Um, getting the person there is often the trick. And if someone's out there listening and you know someone who needs some help, sometimes it's just, let's make that call together. It's mm -hmm. the warm handoff, the don't just tell John to call the mental health center. Let's call together. Let's call Would together. You, you want me to go with you? How can we do this? Would you like somebody to come here first? How can we get to yes? How can we get to your life matters? Mm -hmm. Your life can be improved. Um, but mm. it, 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 it takes a, a village. It takes a team of folks to do that. Um, it but it takes that individual to go, I'm ready. I, you know, let's... Could this look differently in my life if I got some help? Um, again, I think yeah. people are in their boxes and don't don't see that they can that they have other choices. Hmm. Well, and sometimes we have to jump into the box with somebody, and we have to Thank think you. inside the box before we think outside the box, right? Exactly right. As therapists, we often say we have to meet people where they're at. Right. And so, you know, if, if the box is a little constrained because they don't know the other options, well, we got to get in the box help them tear down the walls of that box, yeah. get to yes. I love that you said that. Get yeah. like, how do, we, how do we motivate, empower exactly. to get somebody uh, to that point where they have that hope and they have that, um, that trust in us that, okay, let's get to yes, I'm, I'm worth it. Let's figure out, exactly. let's figure out how to, to move forward. So I wanna just shift to sort of close us out a little bit and just, Think about if you had to leave our audience with a gem around empowering themselves. Is there an example in your own life of something that's helped you live to your full potential or feel empowered? Um, I think a few things come to mind. I, I am a person of faith. I am a person who have eclectic friends, I have lots of walks of life. I, I'm interested in people. And that reminds me of my first resume that I wanted to work with a variety of people in a variety of cultures. <laughs> and that was my only wish, and now I've been doing that. Um, my, really, a sense of gratefulness comes mm. through me, a, a sense of... Um, humility of, of what I see and what I have. Um, and just, I'm grateful that mm. I've, I've had the life I've had and I feel my empowerment is sharing that and, and sharing my love for the world and, mm. and care for people because mm. I truly, I truly care. And, and um, I think that comes through because it seems to be working so far, but um, not sure I've, I've answered that, but I, I, I embrace mind, body, and spirit. I mm. think I try to feed each of those um, in one way or another. That mm. helps me keep going. So. I, I'd, I'd say you answered it just fine <laughs> by saying, you know, have faith, stay yeah. grateful, be humble, and, you know, share. Right share the love and the care and concern that we have for one another. Um, so uh, that was beautiful. 
Well, thank you, Cynthia. I think you're wonderful. I uh, do. It, 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 you lead by example. So I, it, it makes a difference in the tone that it sets for all of us. So mm -hmm. thank you back. Oh, well, thank you. Well, yep. and, and thank you for being the first guest on the I'm Empower honored. Hour with Greater Nashville Mental Health. Can you believe we have a TV show? No. 35 years ago, would you think you'd be the first guest on Greater Nashville <laughs> no. Mental Health TV show? An honor. Yeah. An honor. Well, you. Uh, you were voted up um, I, I by the that. staff. Um, I don't understand that. <laughs> well, I, I think it's I think it's out of the respect not only yeah. for your the time that you've put into the agency, but also just the walk that you walk everywhere you go, which is truly caring. Um, mm about everyone whose lives you touch, um, including mine. Um, so no, I just, I appreciate you and I appreciate that. And um, just just thank you for being here. And, and thank you also to those that have watched the show. And um, again, this has been the Empower Hour with Greater Nashville Mental Health, where our mission is to empower people to lead full and satisfying lives through effective treatment and support. And we are here for you and for our community. And if we're not the right person to serve somebody's mental health needs, we'll help you find someone who is. So thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to more episodes of the Empower Hour. The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.